watching Viewpoint on Ukraine Today, where we are joined by Alexander Sushko, the Research Director for the Institute of Euro-Atlantic Cooperation. Mr Sushko, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. So on the 2nd of, Octo 2nd of October, sorry, uh, Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko met with Russian President Vladimir Putin and Germany's Angela Merkel and France's Francois Hollande in Paris. Can you tell us what was agreed? So that was a meeting very important to clarify the next steps and the sequence of the steps in order to continue with implementation of Minsk agreement. Now we may identify more or less stable ceasefire, but this is a military dimension, hard security dimension of the res resolving conflict. And then we have to proceed to the next stage, which is likely to be some political solution. And here there is uh, things much more complicated than in the military sphere, because then it was very simple, you just not uh, to shoot, uh, in, uh, the sides need to withdraw weapons. So that's quite simple and the uh, monitoring is to be provided. In the political part, there are lots of uncertainty. And uh, the very text of the Minsk Agreement is written in a way which allows multiple interpretations. It, it was demonstrated for many times when the Russian side and separatist side, they interpreted this text in a way totally different from that of, uh, like Ukrainians interpret that on uh, the Western powers. So the meeting was needed in order to agree on the next steps and the conditions to be met in order that these steps to be done. First of all, it is about what is called future free and fair elections in the uh, non-controlled territories uh, of Donbas. And here there are lots of uh, differences in the interpretation because for separatists, for Russia, the major purpose is to use this election in order to legitimize themselves, to legitimize the status quo which is there on the ground. For Ukraine, this is needed in order to re start reintegration and deoccupation of the territories. And the election is maybe the instrument which can be used in order to start this process of deoccupation. First of all, because there are internationally recognized standards um, prescribed by OSCE, signed by Russia and the others, which requires some basic conditions before you start elections. First of all, the, uh, the, the, uh, there should be clear guarantee of physical security of those who are taking part, of the candidates, of voters, of uh, observers, of journalists, regardless of their political views. Uh, then there should be a full freedom of political, legitimate political activity. So Ukrainian political parties should be able to go there openly and to campaign uh, and uh, to, to not just register their candidates formally, but also to be able to, uh, to speak to the local audiences, to, um, to um, campaign on the streets, to have uh, TV uh, broadcasting locally, etc. So there are all these elements which are uh, uh, elements of the free and fair elections should be ensured. This is the hope of Ukrainian side and that the, this is a way how step by step reintegrate this, uh, these territories into Ukrainian political space. And the voting itself is just a final step of that. So in the end you have a voting date and then you have a legitimate local authorities. So this is a Ukrainian position and this is basically supported by the, uh, Germany and France. However, there are some nuances remained, and I think that the next few weeks and maybe even next few months, we will have very strong debates about the, these preconditions for free and fair elections. So for these elections to go ahead, the Ukrainian parliament must enact new legislation. Do you think Poroshenko has enough support from the parliament in Kiev to be good or come good on the promises he made in Paris? Uh, so there is... Uh, there is a question, what, uh, uh, what is 
in this new legislation, because uh, the support depends on the substance, what is behind. According to Ukrainian side, Poroshenko himself and uh, many others who do not object, the purpose of the new additional legislation is to ensure the rights of inter internally displaced persons, first of all, who are now residing in other areas of Ukraine, and their voting rights should be ensured, both passive and active votes. So they need to vote, but they also want to, some of them want to run for elections. And so, and there, is, there should be a specific procedure, uh, because in the normal legislation you just don't have this. So, so if it is about IDPs, it will be accepted. But uh, for Russia and for separatists, this uh, legislation needed for some different things. They need to fix their own, I would say, primacy. So the, the, they want to control fully the process and each, at each stage. And for the, they demand Ukraine to adopt legislation which will be formally uh, under Ukrainian uh, legal umbrella, but in fact it will be fu fully controlled by, by, lo by locals. And some would say that Poroshenko has given away too much. What would your take be on that? Uh, I think that there is no signal that they, they accept, uh, the president accepted something which was not in line with the Minsk agreement. So, uh, uh, me personally, I don't see any, any element which was not agreed beforehand. So, um, uh, certainly there is a, uh, if you wished, if, uh, if Ukraine wishes to have some step-by-step -step political process to reintegrate these areas, they need to go to be prepared some way to conduct elections there. And certainly they need to have, uh, so Ukraine has to compromise on some areas. And by the way, I uh, may just identify that in the society there is a here in the Ukraine, there is a wrong perception of some elements of the agreement. For example, there is a big fear of the amnesty. But amnesty is something which I think would be rather not appropriate for the separatists than for Ukrainians. Because separa uh, amnesty is an instrument which is used on the individual basis, first of all. And this is an instrument which may be used only after the whole investigation over the crime is done and the court takes a decision and the person uh, uh, is uh, uh, declared to be guilty. Yes, and then amnesty may be applied. Not before that, but I'm, I, I think that some people understand amnesty as as amnesty for everybody without any courts. But this is not true. So that is why I think that the government should just explain better their position to the society, in particular that amnesty is not just uh, withdrawal from all legitimate procedures when the crime so is committed. So you would say this is maybe a lack, of, a lack of information? People don't actually understand what was agreed? And then this results uh, in things like what happened on the, the 31st yeah, of August? Uh, Partially, yes, uh, because this is, a, this is a lack of understanding of uh, certain standard procedures. But this is also another side of the story, is that uh, finally, uh, we, the, the, I think that both Poroshenko and the others, I would say, in Ukraine, they are not fully aware about the measure of compromise which Western leader, uh, leaders may offer to Russia. And, for example, when Ukrainians usually say on the amnesty, the French President Hollande said about immunity, which is a little bit different. It also should be interpreted in a way uh, to be appropriate for, for Ukrainian society. Because once it, uh, when it comes to the election, uh, which kind of immunity should be applied and for whom? For candidates or for those who uh, are elected? So, Again, this is an open question. Mr Sushko, that is all we have time for. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. You have been watching Viewpoint on Ukraine Today, where we have been joined by Alexander Sushko, the Research Director for the Institute of Euro-Atlantic Cooperation. Thank you for watching.